Hello, everyone, and welcome to POMED's latest book talk. I'm Zach White, POMED's editorial associate, and I'm delighted to be here today with Janine DiGiovanni, author of the new book, The Vanishing, Faith, Loss, and the Twilight of Christianity in the Land of the Prophets, published in the US this fall by Public Affairs, and which I'm proud to say that I had a hand in editing. Uh, Janine's the author of nearly a dozen books, including The Morning They Came For Us, Dispatches from Syria, as well as a journalist and a war correspondent. She was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2019 and the American Academy of Arts and Letters Blake Dodd Prize in Nonfiction in 2020. She's also currently a senior fellow at Yale University's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs and a global affairs columnist at Foreign Policy. So first of all, welcome Janine and thanks so much for making the time to talk with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So The Vanishing, which is a wonderful book, if I may say so myself, uh, traces the history and current struggles of the dwindling uh, Christian communities in the Middle East. There are chapters on Iraq, Syria, and Egypt, but it's also a really personal book for you. Uh, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit at the beginning about what motivated you to write the book. Well, I've been working in the Middle East for 30 years, and right from the start, from my very first assignment, which was in Israel-Palestine, I was fascinated by the minorities. So I remember going out to interview um, the Samaritans um, 30 years ago and the Bedouins and various groups um, throughout Iraq, the Yazidis, of course, the Kurds who aren't really a minority so much as a, almost a nation. Um, and I really first began to be aware of the Christian minorities, I think around the time of Saddam Hussein. So when I was working there in the early 2000s, I could travel up to Mosul and north of Mosul, Nineveh, and visit the Assyrian, the Chaldean, the Greek Orthodox, the many different sects and people who, who made up that incredible mosaic, what, what, what is the mosaic of Iraq. Um, when Saddam fell, there was this kind of fear amongst especially Iraqi Christians, what would happen to them? Um, whoever was going to come, would it be worse than, would their situation be worse? Because as, as you know, and we'll probably get into this more, um, Christian minorities throughout the Middle East have traditionally been protected by dictators. Um, and each country that I worked in, um, whether it was, I, I focused on four specific places, Iraq, Syria, Egypt, and the Gaza Strip. And many people say to me, why not Lebanon? Why not Bahrain? Um, the reason is that I felt these four communities were absolutely the most uh, vulnerable and the most endangered. And Lebanon, while it has an incredibly fascinating and rich Christian heritage, they're much more assimilated into the political, social, and economic life. Um, I feel like the Christians of Iraq, of Syria, Egypt, Gaza are really going through very unique challenges of their own, extreme challenges. Let's talk a little bit more about those challenges. Um, you've been, as you mentioned, traveling to the Middle East for a long time, making your first trip to Jerusalem around three decades ago. So to start with sort of a bird's eye view of things, how has the situation changed for Christian communities since you first started going? Does it feel different now than it did 30 years ago? Absolutely, because there is this rise of radical, radical groups. I think that um, Christians in the past, especially let's say in the Saddam times, um, under Bashar's father Hafez, under Mubarak, I think they did feel this sense of, they've always felt vulnerable um, and they have been you know, at risk of uh, attacks, whether it's from warring armies or plagues or pandemics or whatever. Um, you know, their numbers have been dwindling, but since the fall of Saddam, for instance, and I'm not a big fan of numbers because I think they're very difficult to gauge. Um, the last census done in Iraq was 40 years ago in, in the Saddam time, and it was 1.5 million Christians. Now, I mean, we really don't know, but there's an estimate of between 100,000 and 150,000. And some people say as high as 200,000. I have been told by um, political scientists in the region that within 100 years, especially in Iraq, Christianity will no longer exist very much in the way that the Jewish community of of Iraq, the Baghdadi Jews who were such prominent, important social economic figures basically disappeared. That community no longer exists. So I always gave the figure of in 100 years, we will see 
and eradication. And I was on a, a call with the Archbishop of Canterbury's team about two weeks ago, and there was a Lebanese bishop who corrected me. And he said, that's an incredibly optimistic figure. Um, it's more like less than 40 years. So that in 40 years time, we will see such a vast shrinking of, of Christians in, especially in the countries that, that I discuss, which is really shocking, considering this is their ancestral land and it's land they've been in for 2000 years. In the book, you talk really movingly about the disappearances of these communities. Um, you know, Armenia and Aleppo, the, one of the oldest Christian communities in Gaza. Um, so if they were to disappear, um, some of them, if you mentioned, are incredibly small, mostly older, lots of the younger people for many different reasons are emigrating. What would these losses mean for them uh, and for the communities where they've lived for so long? I remember, um, and just to listeners out there, Zach played a huge role in this book, doing research, interviews, editing. He really, um, it was at the height of the pandemic when we were doing the actual writing and editing, and he was absolutely an essential part of it. Um, so you remember one story that moved me and that really sticks with me the most is the Armenian, Aleppo Armenian who, held out throughout the war and then finally at one point during the height of ISIS got in his car and drove from Aleppo straight overnight didn't stop went through Turkey and went to Yerevan and what really strikes me about the the, the Armenian um, population throughout the Middle East if they are driven out is that this is their second their second reckoning with a genocide with an extinction and you know they have already suffered so much. And again, the the Armenians of Aleppo are such a hugely important part of it. That ancient Silk Route city and their culture and their contribution. Um, so what we will lose is this mosaic. I mean, I always compare it to a kind of when when I visualize Iraq or Syria, I see a mosaic of different faiths, of different sects, of even. Um, you know, the, the, this unique kind of differentiation between the people. What we don't want is a homogenized Middle East. Um, it just economically, socially, politically is not in anyone's best interest. So I think with the rise and rise of more radi radical groups, this is a big fear. But on the other hand, I was super cautious, as you know, not to turn this into a book that would be used as an excuse uh, for the Trumpists or evangel evangelical community or the right-wing um, settler movement in Israel to, to point out that, that Arabs and Christians cannot live together. And that's not the point of it because they can and they have. They have done for 2000 years. Um, these rise of radical groups throughout the region are for me personally, the biggest challenge working there. Um, before the rise of ISIS in 2014, I was able to move really freely throughout, well, always difficult to get into the regime side of Syria, but certainly I could cross the border at Turkey and get into Aleppo or get into Northeastern Syria. Um, once it, it, ISIS was firmly rooted, it became so incredibly difficult with the kidnapping and murder of my colleagues, um, Steve Sutloff and, and Jim Foley. Um, so this is something for me, and I've worked in the region and throughout the world for many years in violent conflict zones, this rise of, of um, kidnapping, murdering journalists and aid workers and civilians is, is an added dimension. And this of course is what the Christians fear the most. Um, when you talk to them about why they did support Saddam or Bashar al-Assad, they will just say um, they fear what could come after that. And then they say the black flag. And you know, in the worst case scenario for them in Syria, for instance, there was the threat that al-Nusra could, could, could take over. It never was going to happen, but that was their, their real fear. Um, but there's other issues too. I mean, climate change. You know, climate change is something that's really worrying in the Middle East. It's, it's um, warming twice as fast as anywhere else on the planet. And this summer, as you know, I mean, temperatures in Kuwait got to 130 degrees, like unheard of temperatures. And I remember 
you know, I, when you're in Iraq or you sleep on the roof at, at night in the summer and it's the only way you get any air, but you know, the temperature will drop to nineties or eighties even. And I remember sleeping on the roof recently and it was, you know, way over a hundred at three in the morning. Um, so temperatures are drastically rising, which means farming situation, which ISIS, of course, when they went through destroyed the irrigation tubes and the, um, the farmland of the Christians. And then you have the other thing, water, which of course, like the great rivers, the, the Tigris and the Euphrates and the Nile, um, water issues, and people have livelihood along those rivers. So, you know, the, the largely farming Christians of Nineveh um, are facing numerous challenges with droughts, um, floods, um, rising temperatures. So that's another factor. Um, and then the third one is migration. And this really is their enemy. Um, how do they keep young people in situ? How do they keep them there when there's no opportunities? And Gaza, I just got back from Gaza over the summer. Gaza is worse than ever. And it, you know, you and I both read the UN report from 2011, which basically said by 2021, Gaza will be uninhabitable. It's now 2022. So the water situation, the um, again, the electricity cuts, the bombing, the, the I mean, what the Christians of Gaza go through is the same as what the 2.2 point, 2 point mil, 2 million Gazans go through. Um, electricity cuts, fear of bombing, um, restriction of movement, collective punishment, the whole thing. Um, it's just that the Christians are so tiny in number there, only 800. Um, out of a population which had been entirely Christian in the fourth century. So these are all really worrying, worrying factors. Let's delve into that a little bit more because uh, a lot of the, the factors that you've discussed, climate change, unemployment, uh, are things that are affecting the Christian communities in these places, uh, but also everyone there. So to what extent are the problems that Christians in Gaza, in Syria, in Iraq, to what extent are they you know, Christian problems and to what extent are they ones that society as a whole are facing? Right, so um, I think the Christians in Iraq right now fear the most Iranian backed militias. Um, you know, Iran is becoming more and more, uh, Iraq is becoming more and more influenced by Iran and there's much more of a Iranian presence. Um, even I remember going to some villages um, outside of Mosul 2016, 2017, after the, the collapse of ISIS, 2018, 2019, and seeing and hearing Farsi and you know Iranians who had come over and were settling in these formerly Christian towns. So that's really worrying. I think, um, I think the Christians and the Kurds have a very interesting relationship, wary perhaps. I know the Christians I spoke to were very wary of being caught in the middle between Iraqi, uh, especially around the time of the referendum, um, between Iraqi Baghdad and Erbil, um, and that they were gonna be used as some kind of political pawns. So that's really worrying. Um, I think that, you know, I think this is realistic. The Kurds, let's not forget, did all of the heavy lifting during the I, uh, fighting against ISIS and um, really, you know, were not, were not rewarded in any way for that. In fact, were betrayed bitterly by President Trump. So I think for Christians, this is a worry. The other thing is Turkish airstrikes. You know, they are in the line of fire of Turkish airstrikes. That's Iraq. Syria is just purely the geopolitics of the war. The war is going into its 12th year. That is an unbelievably long time to live in war. I mean, I lived during the siege of Sarajevo that was three years um, of a brutal siege. Three years seemed like a lifetime. 12 years, that means children that were born at the beginning of the war are now nearly teenagers. Um, the effect that that will have on not just the economy, but on society will take generations to heal. And the Christians are caught in this. And again, because they have backed Bashar, um, this is complicated. And I think it's gonna be a complicating rebuilding process and reconstruction and how, again, how are they gonna live with their neighbors? Also, there's the displacement. You know, Syria really 
a main issue is refugees who fled, and some of them are Christians. Um, and the, the way that the country will look once reconstruction finally does begin. So I'd say um, for Syrian Christians, it's, it's war, just plain and simple war, which is affecting everyone, of course, but <clears throat> you can't separate those two because it's just so predominant. And, and again, about the number of Christians who've left um, Aleppo. When Aleppo fell, um, you know, the Armenians who had, who had basically toughed it out through the worst times of the siege and the barrel bombs and the, the worst of it just finally couldn't take it anymore. Um, so there's Syria. Gaza, you know, very hard for me to separate what they, what Christians endure there with what everyone else does because it is collective punishment. So, you know, they're part of it. I think the biggest thing for them, the Christians, which might not seem like a big deal to people listening, but it really is, is that they can't leave to go to Bethlehem for Christian holidays. So if they can't, you know, no one can leave Gaza without Israeli permission and without, you know, permission, jumping through numerous hoops. I mean, it's hard enough for me to go to Gaza, let alone a Gazan to leave and to cross through Erez to get to Israel proper. Um, so I think that this restriction of movement means that they haven't been with their families who are in Bethlehem or the West Bank or Galilee, um, in some cases years. And, you know, these, these are very tight knit people. So this has had a direct effect on, on their society. Um, the other thing is that, you know, Hamas always gets blamed and Hamas are not good guys. Um, I think the Christians there, it was the most closed community for me, um, the most difficult to penetrate. And I think they were afraid. Um, you know, they said Hamas had not troubled them at all. There was one incident with a bombing in a church. There was a bookstore that had been burnt down. But when I would try to dive into it, you know, who did it? Was it Hamas? They would just say there were radicals. Um, and of course, there's, there are other radical groups in Gaza. So the thing about Hamas, which I always say is that the occupation and the subjugation of the Palestinian people existed long before Hamas did. So, you know, it's very easy to say, oh, this is the fault of Hamas, but there's many, many factors at play, the largest of which is, I think, for the Christians of Gaza, migration. There's the unemployment is 80%. Um, and yet they are highly, highly educated. Um, I write in the book about going to the um, the home of a young dentist. He had just graduated from dental school, brilliant. And the other striking thing about Gaza, which I'm sure many of your listeners will know is that they're such incredibly well-educated people, I mean, highly educated, um, entrepreneurial, resilient, resourceful, extraordinary, extraordinary people. And the, you know, there are no jobs. There are literally no jobs for them. So dentists, doctors, um, surgeons, you know, people who are highly trained, lawyers, accountants, computer scientists, uh, they just can't find work. And it's very limited to what they can do in terms of training. If they need to leave to get to a training course in Egypt, they can't. They can't go to the US where they've won a, uh, scholarships to Harvard or Syracuse University, they can't go. Um, so that's, that's Gaza. Um, Egypt, is really interesting because Egypt, um, you can be in Cairo and go to a, a nice party um, and be with Christian cops who are of a certain economic level. And they will tell you that they literally have not had any issues at all because they went to the French Lycée, because they live in a certain world, they have money, their families own factories, they're able to exist at a certain level. But then you go to Minya, which is desperately poor, um, where most of the Christians are and where they are actively persecuted. So there, that is where you find the churches being burnt down, the people being attacked, the people being dragged through the streets, the inability to get a job because you're a Christian. Um, and Egypt, of course, it's, it's in the constitution. So it is, it is institutionalized that Christians can't hold high level offices in the military or in the government.
Um, and, you know, it's almost the opposite of Lebanon, where there, within the constitution is a very specific um, clause that says Christians will hold these offices. So Egypt has its own um, issues. There's also the fear of uh, General Sisi becoming more and more and more authoritarian and more of a dictatorship. Um, the fears of being thrown into prison in Egypt are you know, uh, since I started working there 30 years ago, have absolutely jumped um, in crazy figures. I myself feel totally paranoid when I'm there and I never used to feel like that at all. Um, so there's a different kind of level of danger there for Christians, for academics, for human rights activists, for lawyers. Um, so yeah, so I hope that lays out a little bit of, of some of the challenges. Definitely. And speaking of LCC in Egypt, something that you've touched on a few times in our conversation and that you return to many times in the book is the fact that many Christians, definitely not all, uh, as we saw from lots of our interviews, but many Christians supported or continue to support dictators out of a fear of the alternative. Um, one man you interviewed in Egypt described it as the dichotomy of the army or disorder. Uh, and that's definitely something that all of the uh, dictators of the region would like their Christian subjects to believe, to get that support. Um, so how can someone answer those fears? And is there, or what would the place of Christians be in say, uh, post CC Egypt or post Assad Syria? Is there any kind of a model for this? I suppose Lebanon, although, I mean, I'm wary to say Lebanon because Lebanon is undergoing such massive challenges right now. So, but I, I do think, and, and I'm not sure that that worked anyway, the, the way their constitution was set up and having a party, you know, a, um, splitting the, the presidency and the prime minister and the um, speaker of the house. And I, I'm not sure if you work during along those ethnic and religious lines, look at Bosnia. I mean, you know, one of the great mistakes was to have a federation that was divided into three separate parts with three different parliaments and three different health systems and three different um, which is now erupting um, nearly 30 years after the war started. So I think, you know, I don't know how I would reassure people. I know one thing that was extremely reassuring and it was more of a spiritual thing was the visit from the Pope um, last uh, spring. I think the fact that Papa Francesco went to Iraq um, at the time of dire COVID, I think, I don't think vaccines were distributed then, certainly not in Iraq. I mean, even now in Iraq, it's very difficult to get vaccines. Um, but I think that he went and it sent a, an enormous message that, you know, you are not alone, we are with you. Um, and that, you know, signaling that there have to be some policies put in place to protect these people, to protect minorities. I mean, minorities are hugely important in any culture, in any society. But for some reason, Iraq, um, I, I, um, an Iraqi diplomat said to me, and I think it really sums it up, without the Christians of Iraq, there is no Iraq. Without the minorities of Iraq, there is no Iraq. And what ISIS really did was target those minorities in a very systematic and cruel way. And of course they went after the Yazidis who are not Christian, but who have been persecuted throughout time horribly. Um, they went after the Christians. And you know, one of the most chilling things for me was that they painted N above the doors of their homes in, in Mosul, of the Christians that stayed. And the Christians who stayed reminded me of the German Jewish people who stayed in Berlin. Um, you know, the people who courageously either just hid or put their heads down. I mean, I will bear witness um, and stayed throughout the horrors of, of the Third Reich. Um, I'm not making any comparisons, by the way. I'm just saying like the courage of people that decide to, they're not leaving their homes. Um, they are not going. It's a bit like, you know, this morning in Sheikh Jarrah, um, the Palestinian families that said, we are not going. We are not going to be moved from here. We were expelled once in 1948. We will not be expelled again. So I think the families that stayed were, you know, and we spoke to them. You and I both, you know, went over those interviews and it's very different from the people that fled in the middle of the night. But again, 
people often wait till the last minute. And I'm always really curious when I met many of the people who um, during the ISIS time and then after the ISIS time, and I would say to them, you know, why did you wait so long? Like some of them literally waited until ISIS was in the next village and relatives would phone them in the middle of the night and just say, get in your car and go. And they like, you know, had five minutes to grab their documents, their animals, their children, load the cat, the dog, the kids, a bit of food and their, their, their most important documents and get in the car. And they, they just didn't, I think they genuinely believed they would be protected. Um, and that's, well, for me, that is always the really tragic and, and it's shocking still thing about wars, how long people wait. Um, and, and you know what it takes for people to leave their homes um, and to, to flee. And, and so part of this exodus, this modern exodus of Christianity, I think people have to realize um, to rip up 2000 years of roots, how absolutely traumatic that will be for the entire region and the repercussions it will have. So that's why, I mean, I wrote this book very much as an oral history. You know, I wanted it to be a document that would remain like long after I'm gone, long after you're gone. And hopefully that they won't be gone, but let's say they are gone, that someone will pick up this book in a library and say, Christians of the Middle East, what a quaint concept. I don't want that to happen. Um, I, I, you know, I feel that them staying in their land is absolutely imperative to the region. So writing it was in a sense, a way of saying, here it is, here's a document of how they live, what they're going through. You can never say it didn't happen because it did, here they are, they exist. Living stones, as they're called, the living stones. Well, I think that's as good a place to end as any. Uh, and I encourage everyone to pick up a copy of and read The Vanishing uh, to get a copy of this testament. So thank you so much, Janine. Uh, and thank you everyone for listening.